Good afternoon already. In the first place, I want to thank the organizers for the invitation and for the possibility to share my visions on the region and uh, my own country. So uh, actually, I have to say that right from the beginning, I'm professional, I'm wearing two hats. I'm associate professor in the International Black Sea University, and I'm the counselor in the political department, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Georgia. So uh, they generally, I'm professionally wearing both. Today, I specifically like underline just like my first title as uh, uh, as a scholar will be like uh, dominant, so I will be wearing this head, but of course within sight I will have the other one as well, uh, being like sincere and like to totally open within, uh, within limits, to the extent possible. Um, generally speaking about a region and regional cooperation, it's difficult to distinguish, it's not a so-called closed system, because the policies and interactions of the regional actors and global actors are so much intertwined that one can consider some global power as also regional as long as it has its stakes, interests, and uh, device policy. For instance, European Union, China, well, Russia is uh, because of, by dint of its proximity is a, is a regional power, but European Union, United States, China, because of their size and uh, interests in the region, which is particularly new in the case of China, might also be considered regional because they do play their role. Sometimes their role might uh, influence or somehow interact with the role of the immediate neighbors. So I'll try to touch upon um, all these actors. Um, generally, I will start from the uniqueness of the small state, the big states. Um, about five years ago, uh, I was in the Brother organization of some uh, GFSIS, uh, Georgian uh, Foundation of Strategic International Studies, where the director, Alexander Rondeli, who recently unfortunately passed away about two years ago, he had the very first issue of the journal which you mentioned. So it was not my first introduction to some to this organization. And after that, I became the avid reader of all the journals. So it's like really kind of interesting. It was about five years ago that I like first learned about uh, some. And, uh, also, Professor Rodelli gave me his book about small states, about the uniqueness of the small states. And the general difference between small states and big states is that the big one, even, for instance, medium size to big like Turkey, it has more neighbors, it has more interactions, it uh, has to juggle its relations with all the neighbors, and at the same time, it has multiple uh, uh, multiple identities and like multiple affiliations. For instance, Turkey, it's European state, it's Mediterranean state, Black Sea state, Middle Eastern, Caucasus state, even by extension, Caspian state by dint of the project. But uniqueness of the South Caucasus states that they being very small. Also Dr. Mikhail is sorry for interrupting. Can you please slow down ah. for the sake of our uh, the good health of our interpreter? Okay. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> well, then it might take a little bit more than 20 minutes, but I will try my best. So, um, states of the South Caucasus being small in size and population, they also straddle very important region, being, again, so in the European map in the very east, in the Asian map on the very west, and also, just imagine, if you take historical empires like Arabian, Arabic Caliphate and Russian Empire, you cannot imagine more distant political entities, but this region was, it was the overlap was the South Caucasus. So it means that it has really very like deep historical and like cultural roots, and obviously like they are all present in at least historical memory. And of course, kind of they shouldn't be discarded, and it's actually richness of the region. Unfortunately, sometimes some political forces use it as a divisive line, but again, it's up to the wisdom of the population like not to allow them to do so. Um, also, when big country makes mistake, that's a real difference like between big and small, and in the South Caucasus, we in the latter category. If big country makes even big blunder, big mistake, well, it suffers geopolitically, economically, but its statehood is never a question. Well. United States made a terrible mistake in the war in Iraq. Well, uh, its international image suffered, but again, nothing particular uh, happened. When country like Georgia or Azerbaijan make similar mistake, the consequences might, might be much bigger, and therefore it should, it should be taken into account. The countries like Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan should always strive to be relevant in the international arena. A few weeks ago, the, the country celebrated 99th anniversary of the First Republic. 
And of course, we should keep in mind the cautionary tale how these republics ended their existence. Okay, they had very few years, two to three years actually, to devise some strategy, but Britain, because it's war fatigue and because of like alternative already energy route in the Gulfs, particularly in the Persian Gulf, it decided like not to take pains and defend, uh, defend the South Caucasus country. That should be always in the mindset of decision makers. The country should stay relevant and again should realistically assess its capabilities. Uh, well, again, and sometimes uh, inconvenient truths should be admitted. Speaking about energy, they are very important further projects, but there is a possibility that the energy card is no longer will be as strong as it used to be. Shale gas revolution, LNG, so like deep drilling, so they already challenge kind of this like the conventional route. It should be like taking it in code, but there is transportation and of course it's very welcome that this transportation network develops in both direction. In this particular, the analogy of the cross is really very relevant and the more stakeholders and the more benign and economically driven stakeholders are in the region, uh, the better it is. So um, one important also lesson from the experience of the countries, learning uh, on their own mistakes. Well, unfortunately, learning on the others, it would be preferable, but almost never happens. Uh, when it comes to mistakes, miscalculations, or staking too much on one actor or one strategy, there should be adjustment. Well, there are examples in both Azerbaijan and Georgia history, how they, recent history, how they managed to adjust. Georgia, when it was hit first in 2006 by the economic like embargo and uh, sanctions on the part of Russia, it hit our agriculture, it hit our wine industry, but the country readjusted and today we improved the quality of the wine. We started paying attention to the agriculture, which we found out it was on its deathbed, and like we managed to adjust. Today agriculture is growing uh, by, well, not by leaps and bounds, but uh, significantly. Uh, recent economic difficulties that Azerbaijan experienced drove home the issue that over-reliance on the um, energy resources might not be in the long term the wise strategy. And again, there is a program and there is also international understanding. There is a program that diversification is very important. Okay, a couple of months ago there was a conference where the president presided about non-oil sector development. Secretary of State Tillerson wrote a letter specifically mentioning the importance to help Azerbaijan on this diversification. Obviously, it's easier said than done. It doesn't take a conference a letter, but political will is already there. So, well, again, so today I won't like expand much about uh, Armenia or the more since actually like, no one can uh, actually like op oppose and confront, but generally. So it will be really very nice if it becomes the realization that these policies of the 90s of starting the conflict which brought about, which incurred economic difficulty and partial loss of sovereignty, finally actually um, comes to the mind of the politician. I know personally, I have been to Armenia several times, many people, well not many, but some people do already understand it. They understand the futility and the erroneousness of the policies of the, uh, of the early 90s, but now unfortunately it's too late and again it's also fate of the uh, fate of the small state. Um, very important, uh, again, speaking of uh, actors, obviously, the relations, Turkey, um, Georgia, Azerbaijan has been exemplary, and uh, the countries, notwithstanding having ties with the others, never forget about their strategic trilateral partnership, their regular meetings on the level of the experts, of the level of the governments, on bilateral level, and it is understanding that like whatever other different visions might be, for instance, like the relations with the European Union might be different, but still this regional uh, cooperation is extremely important and, and being given significant priority. It is very important that Iran and China enter the region, so very, very hopefully Iran will shed its isolationist, international isolation because of P5 plus 1 um, formula. It might become P4 plus 1, regrettably, but like Hopefully not. It depends on the uh, wisdom of the um, politicians in uh, in Washington, like strategically. So, but obviously, European Union has a serious stakes in the region. European Union again needs the region as stable, and in this particular case, involvement of other actors will be also have a stabilizing effect. So, uh, China through its uh, 
One Belt, One Road, and other economic web projects is becoming increasingly important. Georgia recently signed a free trade agreement with China, and the trade with China is growing really at just like a double-digit rate. And now it's third or fourth trade actor, and usually change within the year. It might be about, projection might be fourth trade actor, but at the, at the end of the year it might end up to be, you know, to be third. That's, that's fast the relations grows. And next year, if the projection uh, holds, like Georgia will be exporting more wine to China than to Russia, which will be like a serious achievement. It means kind of we will not be vulnerable to another, for instance, like a caprice of Anishinko, kind of who is actually like the sanitary chief of Russia, like to find some uh, harmful substances in Georgian wine. So now we're already immune from that. And this is, of course, a serious achievement. And, but of course, we are no longer naive. Well, we have paid heavy price. So as I say, as a Georgian citizen for for instance, like sub outside the expectations, particularly as far as the help from the West is concerned, in terms of hard power in particular, and we of course understand, for instance, like however China is involved economically, it won't be able because of the different states to confront Russia politically, well, and geopolitically if push if push comes to show. Therefore, yes, there is a strategy to somehow improve relations with the, uh, with the Russian Federation. The rhetoric is already like different, but of course this is a glass, there is a like glass ceiling and there is a like uh, conflict, which like Russia like supported, okay, unlawfully recognized provinces and independent states, and this is a non-starter in terms of like true political rapprochement. Yes, that's unfortunate, but it takes time to heal uh, these wounds and of course actually probably a different leadership in Russia. So again, one important part when it comes to trade and like relations, uh, sometimes domestic and international policies could, they're also like difficult to, uh, to distinguish, to decouple. Sometimes the country might have very lofty, very ambitious international agenda, but because of the domestic policies, there is no underpinning. Well, Georgia in the 90s, early 2000s has been case in point. For instance, after like Georgia and Azerbaijan, the leaders of this country and some important decision makers in the United States reached the agreement with Baku Tbilisi J. Khan, which was a serious lifeline for Georgia. And for Georgia it was, as well as to Azerbaijan, for in, in, in an important measure, the establishment of the true self-reliance and independence, like economic independence, like from Russia and providing Europe with alternative route. So after that, Georgia at that time well, because probably the leader was relatively more uh, more liberal. I mean, like Shabarnadze, even like in Soviet times, you can actually hardly distinguish actually in Soviet times more liberal and a less liberal scholar, um, functionary. But again, even within Soviet system, Shabarnadze tend to be like tended to be more liberal. He accelerated the path to the West. The fact that Georgia was admitted to the Council of Europe earlier than the two other countries in the region. The fact that in 2000, when NATO Secretary General was supposed to visit three countries of the region, it, he visited only Georgia because Georgian leadership defied the warnings from Russia that kind of these uh, visits are inadvisable. Yes, it got its like first uh, economic punishment by in terms of the, the stress, by tightening of the visa regime, but that was obvious political will to join the West. Unfortunately, economically and domestically, kind of the country was corrupt, pretty much a failed state, and domestic policies could not support the uh, foreign policy. This is also should be like kept in mind. And in this particular case, when we talk about serious economic interactions between the states and other uh, stakeholders, obviously, well, it is very welcome that Azerbaijan is thinking seriously about diversification. Georgia also has its like serious economic reforms in terms of like opening. Okay, they should be healthy, normal capitalism with venture capital. Well, one can decide whether have social democratic model or more libertarian. It's already it's secondary. But first of all, it should be real healthy economic development, which might create political development as well. So, and most importantly, it will lessen the um, significantly lessen the likelihood of the. Uh, conflict resumption. Obviously, in this particular case, kind of the, I would say, the biggest tumor on the body in the region is the Nagorno Karabakh, which will have terrible consequences for entire region, including like Georgia as well. It might involve Russia and Turkey uh, by proxy, which, and, and therefore, this is a, the worst case scenario. And again, presence of more actors, presence of more stakeholders, which will might balance each other and stabilize the region, is particularly welcome. So it's like really very good that like Azerbaijan, Iran are joined, joined by, uh, Azerbaijan and Turkey are joined by Iran and uh, Iran and China and 
whether hopefully kind of the United States will finish its like, transitional period and will, will return to the region as a benign actor who props the independence of the, of the countries. Again, we should actually remember when there is no mainstream policy of major actors, some other interest group take precedence. This, okay, silly, you can like name it, counterproductive reductionist like Section 907 adopted in 1992 uh, like against Azerbaijan was, well, by the Armenian interest group occurred precisely because the policies of the country did not exist yet. So the region was viewed only through, through the prism of Russia. Today, this document stands as, as, like, as an example of futility because, well, it didn't harm Azerbaijan at all because actually kind of the income that Azerbaijan like, generates like, from uh, its economy and interaction from the United States far exceeds the, um, uh, the, the money which would be allotted by through the USAID Freedom Support Act. But still, it is important that Absence of well thought out policy brings like other actors which might have more parochial uh, ends in the region. So, um, so dear George, can you please wrap up? Okay. So, um, therefore, I just like very briefly to what I'd like to tell about so uh, my country about how the country again very briefly that the country tries to be relevant and its relevancy it finds is with. Uh, strong interaction and uh, potential, I would say, at least cultural, economic, well, not yet political integration with the European Union. The fact that like, Europe became much closer to Georgia by the end of the visa liberalization, this is a very important factor. And in this particular way, um, context, I just I also want to say that the country now, my country, it, it's sort of past this like care dependency, if you will, uh, mechanism. Today, it, most of the population, of course not all, most of the population understand that actually this modernization and political pluralism, which the country enjoys, it's their good in their own right, not because of the good is from the, uh, from the European Union. That's an important factor. It was about 15 months between the day when the European Union admitted that Georgia completed like, the necessary reform and deserves visa liberalization and the actual enactment. These 15 months were difficult time in the um, history of the country because there were many forces who tried to say, you see, European Union doesn't deliver, okay, they, they never need you, but the country passed it. So therefore, I think this is like a positive example of, okay, global vision and regional vision. Thank you very much. Looking forward to your questions.